ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother into the temple, the man at the head of Diskami Studios, a man, who, a man who's no stranger to this, to the holy, to the holy ground here. Man, some of you may know him through Besom, which we'll be talking about. Some through Anime Five E or through the previous works on the in the older era. But now he's now he's back with a retro second edition, along with some further expansions for fourth edition. Congratulations on getting funded in about two hours. The one and yeah, only thank you. Mark McKinnon. How you doing today, man? Good, good. It's uh, it's a great to be back. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you, thank you for com thank you for coming on. So this is this is one of the this is one of those things that I, in the times that I've had you on, I've I've kind of danced around, and I knew this kind of thing was coming after the uh, after the announcement a little while ago. But. <laughs> Was were was you talk about this being a dream for a decade? Is this was this essentially you tr you try your attempt to try and bring some of the library back in the Guardians of Order days back into the public? Because a lot of that has been um, out of print or in or in the void for years. Yeah, I mean that's a great question, and uh, and and honestly, not not too much. That wasn't the primary motivation. The big thing is moving forward with the uh, intellectual properties, whether it's Bessem or Absolute Power uh, or the Tristest system itself. To move forward with that, what when we licensed it from Paradox back, uh, you know, five years ago now, going on six. So we're developing it. And at some point, the rights were going to revert back to them. And so all the work that we put into it and all the development work and, and the expansion of the improvements to the IP would then go back to the rights holder. And be, even before we'd licensed it, going back for the past decade, uh, I tried to acquire to repurchase it back from when we original sold the White Wolf and then White Wolf went to CPP and then CPP went to Paradox. So we tried to get it back and the best we came up with was a licensing agreement, which we were happy, certainly happy enough to do so because it, it got us a chance to come out with Best in Fourth Edition and the new Absolute Power uh, Silver Age Sentinel Second Edition. Mm -hmm. So it was certainly good to be able to do the licensing, but in the end, there, it's not quite the same as owning the property and having 100% control so uh, whenever the opportunity came up for another discussion, uh, you know, continuation of what we had started 10 years earlier, whenever that had a chance to come up, we uh, uh, came to an arrangement and we acquired the properties in full at that point, which made us so happy. But it wasn't specifically to put out older product because the older product is legacy. And, you know, as a, as a game designer personally and as a company director, I mean, I've improved over the years. And, and I think that the game design for, Bessem and the Tristat system has evolved to a point where I think it's it's in a better place than it was 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. But we knew that Bessem Second Edition back in 2000 uh, has its fans. I mean, it got doubly Origins Award nominated for Best Craft Design and Best Game of the Year. Uh, it was up against some some pretty tough. tough competition so didn't end up winning but we know that Bessem second edition brought a lot of fans into uh, the company at the time and so getting a chance to revisit it in a retro edition with uh, some of the updates and, and upgrades that we did was something that we wanted to do a throwback for the fans yeah and I've talked with I've talked with a lot of people over over the, over the last nine years that I've been doing this cha this channel it'll be 10 years this may, this may and a lot of people have cited Besom as their fir as the first introduction to the idea of taking anime and manga concepts, something that some circles find ver find verboten, and I still laugh, into tabletop RPGs. Besom was their was their earliest entry into that. I've I've seen some that's I've seen some that say Teenagers from Outer Space, but Teenagers from Outer Space is a more specific affair. As as opposed to Besom, which was a bit more universalist, right? Certainly, as I mean, Tifos is 
probably the first anime role-playing game that I would say, although they didn't lean as heavily into anime as a, as a concept because it wasn't as popular in North America, but certainly uh, it, it was what I'd consider the first one that achieved any kind of real success here, but it was very genre-specific. And so when we did Bessem as a multi-genre game, mm -hmm. that uh, I think did strike the the anime fans and showed something to role players uh, what what was possible. Uh, in fact, I don't know if you probably have known that, but when I started the very first edition of Bessem back in 1996-97 when I was working on that, was originally going to be a Ranma role-playing game. It wasn't, wasn't going to yeah. be licensed. I was doing this for myself. And, you know, like Tifos, uh, it was very much in that romantic comedy uh, era, and that's where it started. And then I realized I could expand it out into a multi-genre game, but it was where it, it began was was uh, very similar to the TFOS. Yeah, and I I do have to slightly correct myself because in a lot of cases there's there there's been th there's been three major entries from the from the from that 2000s um, era that I've se that I've seen cited. Um, Besom Second is is one of them. The other one the other one that is tangentially related and and is is using the same mechanics, so I'm kind of cheating. <laughs> is the is the Sailor Moon RPG. In yeah. fact, I if and if it sounds like I used the, I used that as a gateway to get to get to get people in and get them hooked on tabletop. Well, I did. <laughs> uh, can't can't accuse me of being an evil genius if I'm honest. Yeah, <laughs> true. But the thir the third, of course, was sl was um Slayer's D20. Those were those right. were three big um, cases, and I know I know you had mentioned um, Besom D Besom D twenty as a lot of people's entry point. I didn't have that kind I didn't have that kind of luck with where I was running at that time. Uh, but I am cu I am curious if the move for this retro release of second edition will that also will that also mean that you have plans on putting putting some of the other second second edition material on di on digital stores yeah, well, certainly the that's been asked about what our plans for Bessem Second Edition is, and and right now on Drive Through RPG, uh, pretty well the entirety of the Bessem Second Edition line is available. I think there's one or two products that uh, I can now upload after the acquisition, uh, and none of the licensed products are there, so nothing from Slayers, Tenchi Muyo, Sailor Moon, or uh, you know, Hell's Helsing. Ghost Dog, like nothing licensed because we don't have the rights to that. That's that's a license deal. But in terms of the the games and the systems for Bessem Second Edition or Silver Age Sentinels, they're all available now, and they have been available in in uh, digital format under the old White Wolf Company for quite a long time. And so mm -hmm. we want to keep supporting those. So some people have asked, are we going to come back and do some stuff in print? Are we going to continue the Bessem line? And you know, my answer is that wasn't part of the plan that this was a throwback core book as opposed to the line the line plan because Bessem fourth edition is the future of Bessem yeah. until you no know, until that changes in the future but we're moving forward looking back was a fun retro thing that's that's interesting to do as, as a core release but we are like as a as the game designer who's worked on Tristat since 1997 uh, and although David Pulver was the 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 biggest uh, designer for Bessem Second Edition. But looking at, at where Tristat has been, I am happier with the current iteration of Tristat Core, Absolute Power, Bessem, where it is now than what it was 20 or uh, 25 years ago, going back to 1997 with Bessem First Edition. I think the game is better now. Mm -hmm. But better is subjective, and a lot of people cut their teeth on on Bessem the Second Edition. People are saying that's the first game they've been introduced to, or along with Dungeons and Dragons, that was the first game. That was the one they played in high school or university. So it, it certainly means a lot to me personally, which is why having a chance to bring it back in a retro edition uh, to people that might have missed it the first time, or maybe their their books are a little bang up and they and they want a, a fresh copy, given that it's been out of print for uh, over twenty years. Uh, this is the opportunity for that, and so we're thrilled to be able to do so there is one entry in the besom family which i'm curious if it's if this is something you're considering um taking a second look at go going forward and it was something that was kind of integrated into the tristat family back then and that's hong kong action theater so yeah so the hong kong rights will have but were sold off uh to you know the the 
moving forward with the game. Obviously, we published the second edition of it, mm -hmm. but I, I do not have a right to do more Hong Kong action theater that uh, is now in other people's properties. Same with Swords of the Middle Kingdom, mm -hmm. uh, same with uh, several other smaller properties that that's no longer with us. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't have any more plans for that. Yeah, I, was, I wasn't... A lot, a lot of the ones that are associated with the license, I can, I can see where, th where their status was going to be. That was one of the weirder ones, right? It wasn't right because Guardians of Order did own that when we, when we bought the assets of uh, Event Horizon Productions, uh, that came with the package uh, and that, uh, and I said, the Swords of the Middle Kingdom. Uh, but we had since divested ourselves of that a very long time ago. Whenever Guardians of Order was was winding up business operations. Mm -hmm. Oh. Now, with that in, with that in mind, when it comes to the, when it comes when it comes to this um, second edition, this re this red book, um, is it is it mainly is it mainly just cleaning up just cleaning up the original text and make making it making it so that it's um, as navigatable as as one can make it up to modern standards with PDFs as as well as with um, the physical version. Yeah, well, there's certainly some uh, adjustments to the layout. Uh, you know, whenever we did this, the regular second edition, that was in color. And then when we did a revised edition, we changed the layout a little bit, but then we shrunk the text and went to black and white because at that point it was effectively a reprint. So we just, at that time, the company couldn't afford to do another color edition. So we went with black and white. With retro, we've gone back to color. We've uh, expanded the layout a little bit, increased the font size so it's not quite as tiny. Revised second was very, very tight. So we've we've made a little bit more airy, a little bit more legible for that. Um, I think cleaned up some of the the flow, but then also added in some additional content, whether it's in the in the species and class templates that we introduced with you know in best some third and fourth edition. We thought, well, that's a really good thing to bring in, so people don't have to kind of flounder when they're there. And and these were some of the aspects taken from the different second edition expansions, like Bessem Dungeon, uh, Bessem Fantasy Bestiary. There were some expansions we ended up doing that use some of these elements, but what were this gave us a chance to bring them into the core book. And so there's extra monsters uh, stats that we have. We never had stats in the core for monsters in the core Bessem book itself. They were always relegated to the expansions. Now there's a selection of them in the core book, not to say this is now a bestiary. It's not It's not a monster manual, mm -hmm. but it's to show you what you can do with Bessem by here's 20 different monsters. And so people can see what they're, how they're statted out. So it's including some extra content from that. And then a, a, one other thing that I was as a designer and a publisher, very hesitant back in the early 2000s were social oriented skill or defects, the things that we thought were best attributed to role-playing only rather than integrated into the point-based system. I've since refined my thoughts on that and we've brought in more social mechanics into Bessem 4th edition and so it made sense to bring those into 2nd edition as well into the retro just uh, to make it a little bit more complete and I wouldn't say modern because it's still very much a 2000s game but just a, a few things to acknowledge where gaming has gone and where the Tristat system has gone uh, to put it back in even though now it's kind of moving forward to 4th edition we managed to insert it back into retro so that was the main cleanups is, is a a lot of visual cleanups, some extra templates of monsters, a few additional extra rules, but mainly it is still very much second edition. This is not a new game. This is second edition, but a, a retro version of it. Yeah, and I know I know in one of the recent um, up one of the recent updates on the Kickstarter, you had put up a bit of a comparative difference as far as what changes between second and fourth. Um, in the spirit of that, do you plan on making a conversion guide in as a either within this retro second edition P, um, book or as an add-on down, down the road that goes into what um, what you might have what you might have to do or what legwork to convert stuff from fourth to second and vice versa? Yeah, well, whenever we're publishing uh, and writing Best and Fourth Edition, one of the things I looked at is, can I put a conversion guide into Best and Fourth Edition from Best and Second? And the the answer ended up being no. It's it's there's no conversion. There's you can translate and you can um, kind of replicate what's in Second Edition into Fourth, but there's no 
there's no easy translation, uh, a conversion. It's so complex and there's so many working parts and moving parts that you, I would have to basically tell people completely strip down second edition to nothing and rebuild it as fourth edition. That That's the conversion. It's really redo it completely uh, because everything was balanced back from the starting point. So no, there's not really a way to convert it. But that said, if you look and you know something has a, a stat from somewhere between one and 12, well, that's the same whether it's best in second edition or best in fourth edition. So you can say that the number is still the same, but point wise and how it integrates with the rest of the game, how your, your combat interacts with your health and interacts with the attributes and defects and skills that is such a complex system that it's better for just someone to thematically take what was in second if they want to convert it to fourth or vice versa uh, i think looking at some of the the key ideas but in the end it's not going to be a conversion mm -hmm. so with that in with that in mind when it comes when it comes to the even even if it even if it can't be a one a one to one, um, I'm guessing that you plan on having some adv some advice for for that sort of interpretation kind of thing. It's the advice is really you have to you have to look and, and translate. Like I specifically mentioned that it's not a convertible. You can't convert from second to fourth. There's no path of conversion. Uh, and that is mentioned specifically both in fourth edition and in retro second that mentioning that they're not compatible, I thought was important. I don't want to give everyone a uh, kind of a false idea that they can just use the content that they're very different uh, equipment. It's almost like when you look at you know, D and D second edition, AD and D, which is what I got started on. And with currently, fifth edition uh yeah some things are going to be similar but you, you can't convert them you can't use the same material in both games because they're they're very different foundation of how they're built yeah i can i can cert i can certainly get that now with that with that in with that in mind uh, there is of course the possibility that somebody who's back who got into um fourth might end might end up dipping into um, second and I'm, gu I'm guessing that e that this is written as much in mind for people who are who might get into second with this as it is with people who are getting into or have gotten into things through fourth yeah i mean uh, anyone who's a, a best of fourth edition fan i would I would hazard a guess to say most of them are familiar with, with Bessem from 2nd Edition. I don't think we're getting a lot of entry points into a game like Bessem 4th Edition, people that don't know anything about Bessem. It's certainly possible, but I don't think that's as likely. But what we're hoping to do is take some people who are 2nd Edition fans who played it 20 years ago, but either maybe didn't know about 4th Edition or haven't converted over, and this is giving a chance to remind them about what's great about Bessem and the hope that we can get some of these 2nd Edition players over to fourth edition to to start looking at what the future of Bessem is going to be going backwards not as much because i do think most people who are you know Bessem fans are have been in it for quite a long time either through second or maybe even back as far as first edition plus the, plus there's the issue of spinning plates i don't think you'd want to um um have have to support two editions at the same at the same time um you you can look at TSR trying to support both basic and advanced simultaneously. You know, that, that that's goes. a great example. We're, we're obviously a much smaller company than, than TSR ever was. Um, and it's it's not even just the idea of supporting multiple copies of uh, in different editions of the same game brand line, but it's also just a total volume of work that, you know, we have our anime 5e line, we have our Tristat line, we have Absolute Power, and we have Bessem, and we're working on new stuff in the future. And so for us, it, it doesn't make sense for us to try to have a second Bessem line when we think Bessem 4th edition is wonderful. And we're really happy the directions that's going. This was always intended as a uh, one-time throwback, but at the same time, we're, we're a an agile small company we're flexible and we can kind of go where the the fans uh would like to see us go um gotta pause one moment so norm normally i don't ask this in interviews but because but this is part of the tradition it's it seems with me and part of my reputation but with sec with second edition at um do you do you 
I have to I have to make the it, will there be an index joke because <laughs> that seems that yes seems to be, that absolutely we we like to have uh, good indexes and uh, good table of contents as well. Um. Now with this, and I I know with I know that seems obvious, but there have been so many different games I've seen over over the over the nine years that I've been doing this that either put out a big PDF with no bookmarks or a bit or a big book without an index. Yeah, it can happen. Um, as much as I like rifts, um. Palladium is a repeat offender when it comes to this. Like, navigate, and for for a bit of context, I st I studied web usability in college, and navigation is one of those things I will always be big on. You know, because when you're when you're GMing or when you're or some or sometimes when you're a player, you need you need a certain bit of info. Exactly when you need it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I don't, I don't think anybody wants to go fun, go funneling through the the old players' handbooks so they can figure out, okay, what exactly is Thaco? <laughs> Their first time through, <laughs> or the or the 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 whole what the whole what it, how do you actually grapple in third edition? Right. Oh. That that and explaining attack of opportunity because that was so counterintuitive early on. Yeah, now everyone knows that it. it's like common now, but at the time, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I I understand. I realize that I realize that those are easy things to pick on, but um, I hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are cremated equal. I.e., everybody gets the roast. <laughs> but, That's true. <laughs> um, and I will, I, 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 I will admit that one of, I'd say one of the big things that anybody jumping from fourth to this retro second would have to deal with is something that I talked about the first time I had you on, which was the shift between um, roll high and roll low, and roll low, because right. back in the second edition of days, days. A lot of the material, whether it be Besom or some of the other stuff, was aim low, and from thir from third onward, you shifted to aim high. Yeah, there. I mean, certainly GURPS is another one that was a roll low game, and, and uh, it was more common in the past. I think roll lows are, are less common now, and yeah, Besom Fourth Edition uses roll high, uh, but sure, Second Edition Retro still using that roll low. Mm -hmm. As as th as things should be. But with with that kind of thing with that kind of thing in mind, uh, the hang on, let me. Ch okay, so sorry, I had I had to double I had to double check something. The when it came to trying to introduce the concept of think of things like of things like the class templates, was it? Was it relatively easy to put to put in, or were were there a few cases where there had to be some judgment calls there because there wasn't a equivalent that could be used? No, I mean a lot of the ideas. Yes, we do have uh, class and and race race or, or species template in Bessem Fourth Edition, but they still existed in Bessem Second Edition books as well. For example, Bessem Dungeon is one that I'll I'll mention that you know when you're going dungeon crawling, there were some. Uh, classes and different species that you can play. Uh, same with the fantasy, fantasy bestiary. We talked about how you can in, in incorporate some of these monsters into you know, gameplay as uh, characters. And so the idea of that was already done. All I need to do was actually either translate, uh, either if it's new from fourth edition being brought into second edition, or pick up what was already in some of the other Bessem second edition expansions. Mm -hmm. I can, I can get that. Now. I'd like to sh I'd like to shift a little bit towards Icarus, 
which is a, is a is one of the settings that you've had in the in the multiverse, and I do re I do recall um, visiting on visiting on Icarus um, previously. So one one of the thing one of the things I'm cu I'm curious about is anytime I see a setting or a world that somebody's developing, I'm always curious about the, for lack of a better term, appendix N. Especially since right on the cover you have it at you have it subtitled "Epic Fantasy Anime Adventures." So, what would be some of the materials that ser that served as inspiration for what would become Icarus? Well, Icarus went through uh, like uh, everything in the Bessa Multiverse setting went through various stages. So, the first, and this actually came back from um, Bessem Third Edition. Mm -hmm. So we're going back um, you know, pretty well 20 years ago when it first came out and, and the idea of it, we were creating a multiverse world and we set up these uh, prime worlds, which are kind of like the ones that are the most real. Uh, they, they were forming a council in the prime worlds. One of them was Akaris and Akaris was a, the kind of epic fantasy world. So it's been around in its very basic form as saying, here's the multiverse and here's a bunch of different worlds. That carried through into Bessem 4th edition core rules. Then we did the Bessem multiverse setting book, which which was taking the entire multiverse and going into more detail on the cosmos itself, in which case there was a chapter devoted to Icarus. And so we expanded it out more and there's a, a chapter for all of the different prime worlds as well as some of the secondary worlds. So what we're doing is going one more step. And so now we're taking what we had the chapter and we've turned it into a book now. And so it's a, been a progress in terms of how it is expanded but Bess and Macaris, it, it is a setting book, but it's also a genre book. And this is one thing that the initial inception for these world splat books, you know, to, to use a vampire term, so to speak, from Masquerade, um, the idea of these splat books was they, they weren't just to be setting, they was setting and genre. And so all of the different prime worlds of the Bessem multiverse, they're all different genres. This happens to be the epic fantasy genre and so we do cover the the world and its peoples and the you know what's going on with the geography and the items and the current events but then also we have a chapter about epic fantasy and specifically anime epic fantasy here's how you make an epic fantasy game for anime here's some of the things you consider here's some of the the themes and techniques you use and that's one thing that that's always been big with Bessem itself is we've always kind of emphasized playing the genres because and, and the tropes for those because that's what makes Bessem an, an anime game partially it's 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 a universal system like GURPS or Hero or, or many many other universal systems but it's part of these tropes and the the conventions of the genres why we want to do Bessem as our anime role-playing game. And we're carried this through with chapter four uh, in Icarus, which talks about epic fantasy anime games. Um, I will state that compared to other compared to other universal games like Besom and, and Hero, I can bring that I can bring that to a given table without feeling like death. As much as I like Be much as I like GURPS and and Hero when it comes to actual playing. There is a special kind of hell when it comes to character creation sessions for GURPS. <laughs> yeah, I mean, everyone has their own uh, pain points, I guess, when it comes down to a system, especially when you look at comprehensive point by systems. There's going to be some similarities between Bessem, you know, Tristat, uh, GURPS, Hero System, some of the other new ones as well. There's going to be some similarities, but of course the execution is going to be where the difference is. Yeah lie and some people prefer more crunch and some people a little less and it's everyone has their yeah. preferences for for me for me it was just the case of Ger gurps is extremely front loaded like once you actually get to the once you actually get down to brass tacks it's not it's not that difficult but because of because of how because of how many traps can be laid with that analysis paralysis issue that I've talked with you and many others about you can have cases where you don't have one session zero, you have a multi-part campaign of session zeros, and then somebody brings in the expansion books, and this becomes less of a session and more of a cry for help. Ah, right. Uh, and of course, um, well, Hero System 6th Edition, as much as I love that, um, the core book is an absolute monster to the point where if I threw it, it would probably be considered an offensive weapon. 
you know, just mm -hmm. ima just imagine somebody la um, launching that out of a arbalest or, so or some or some old school siege weapon. You know, because that thing, the character creation is five hundred pages. Oh. Yeah, it's 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 a beast, and, and we while we were cut from the same general cloth of a of a point based effects based system, uh, we typically come a lot lighter on the page count of, of what the the character creation system is. Well, I, I remember you I remember you saying to to me before that the thing that you cut your teeth on and what led to the chain of events to the, to the creation of Besom was Amber. Yeah, which is kind of the antithesis of a game like Hero or GURPS. It's it's extremely rules light, and that's my favorite style of play. Uh, you know, it's if Bessem is not a diceless game, and Bessem is not a really really rules light game. It has some complexity to it, but I took inspiration from how an, a rules light game can be elegant and airy and, and really focus on the narrative. Yeah, I know. So, I I actually don't mind um, diceless games, and I do recall that there was a mod in Besom Extras to do it diceless if someone so mm -hmm. wanted to. Um, and I've co I've covered my fair share of of diceless games, some good and some bad, but none of none of the bad ones were bad because they were diceless. It's because of, it was because of the execution, like say Marvel Universe w way back in the early two thousands, the redheaded stepchild right. of Marvel RPGs. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the games might be a diceless games, but when they use other randomizers, they're truly diceless. But what made Amber stand apart is it's randomless. Yeah, and that is, but even anyway, having calling something the randomless role playing game doesn't make sense. So calling it a diceless RPG was a good marketing tool, but it's really a randomless RPG. And and uh, I think the ideas of what you can do with narrative play, uh, I'd like to think that we can bring some of those into our TriStack games like Bessem. Yeah. I've, I've talked, I've talked, el I've talked else elsewhere on this, but I've I've seen some people refer to games that utilize cards, like say, um, like like say the Saga system that TSR had back in '95, um, a diceless game. I don't consider, I don't call it that, because it's still using cards with that fate deck. So therefore, it's still using some form of randomization. Right. Um, a a recent example of a full-on diceless game would be something like the recently reviewed sufficiently advanced on the on this channel or um xenoscape those those are those i'd consider full diceless because there is mm -hmm. no random there is no randomizer with it um both of them are doing it are doing it differently and sufficiently advanced is a strange beast <laughs> i'll put it that way but the but the but there is there is room for, there is room for that, and when, now Icarus is referred to as epic fantasy, and there's been a lot of debate in various not just gaming circles but just storytelling circles in general on different styles of fantasy. So I'd like to ask, what is epic fantasy to you? What does that entail? What do you believe that tries to encourage and so on yeah a, a lot of it i mean certainly when something is fantasy and it's anime at the same time it's it's almost by definition epic fantasy the, the way a lot of the the anime tropes work um it, it really comes down to to the scope and everything in epic fantasy is just it's larger than life so think of something like lord of the rings that is definitely not epic fantasy uh, you know, it's much more grounded, much more down to earth. But epic fantasy, when you're looking at something, and there's there's no you know perfect example for me to put it from from anime, but something where people are carrying swords that are ten foot long swords and gigantic armor, and they might have uh, clockwork mecha uh, that goes along with it. It's it's less about the scale and more about the spectacle of it. It is this. Uh, overpowered not overpowered in the sense that the player characters you know, can do too much it's an unbalanced system but overpowered in the sense of the the epic scope of the adventures that you're going to have it doesn't do things in moderation and that's what what epic fantasy what Icarus is it is it is just 
huge. And that's what we're kind of going for. It's not going to be in every single element, but what defines it as opposed to a, from a, a much tighter realistic fantasy, maybe something like a, like a Game of Thrones or um, Record of Lotus War, if you're bringing an anime reference, uh, something like that, is just it's a little on the gonzo side for its scope. Um, would you would you say that that epic fantasy would lean more into the mythic? In the it's certainly yeah yeah that's that's a good way to to put it. And what I what I mean by that is is quite literally the the type of scope that's often seen in mytho in mythologies in cla in classical mythologies throughout different cultures, whether it be whether it be the ridiculous the ridiculousness of the 12 labors of hercules or the, or the various the various cycles in irish myth which a good chunk of them i am not going to try and pronounce because my gaelic is absolutely horrible <laughs> oh. or the or the or even, or just the entirety of of hindu mythology which there's nothing low scale about any of that. If you've if you've seen any movie based in based in that particular um, area, um, if I had to, if I had to use a if I had to use a anime example of this, obviously it'd be a, it'd be a bit obvious. But I'd bring in um, R. G. Veda, which is based mm. on the Rig Vedas, so kind of going full circle there. Yeah. Um, just these just these lar these larger than life characters and situations that are not a case of of um of like of like being being a being a king of a country in these kind of situations is the starting point um uh, you're deal you're dealing with characters whose whose actions are going to have massive consequences and of, of course that's where the whole scale thing comes in Oh. Yeah, and a lot of a lot of epic fantasy is going to be a little bit higher level than uh, a more standard, let's say, D and D esque fantasy. Uh, certainly, you do have you know twentieth level characters in D and D, but when you when I think of of epic anime fantasy, I'm thinking of uh, things where the characters are going to have more power. They're going to have more commanding presence in what they do. They're going to be fighting villains that equally match them on that scale. Uh, I've actually just currently right now, I'm watching the new um, Masters of the Universe Revelations that just came out on Netflix and going through that. And is, some of that reminds me of this epic fantasy scale where it's just so big and large Skeletor and He-Man. You know, they, they are outrageous. And if you're bringing it into Japanese anime, uh, that uh, Tom got reincarnated as a slime. Uh, where I remember a scene watching that where uh, the main slime protagonist basically just kills ten thousand people, and there's this countdown as he's going because he had to harvest these souls from from ten thousand monsters dying. It's just an outrageous spectacle, and that is that is a car horse. That is epic fantasy. Of, of course, on the video game end of things, I could bring up any any entry in the Dynasty Warriors games and. While I'm at it, the entirety of um, Wuxia and uh, and anything that is in the Tiancha um, ca category of things. Are you familiar at all with the concept of Tiancha as far as storytelling? No, not at all. Well, the, there's a lot that goes into it, but the best way for me to describe it is a lot of the Kung Fu cinema that you've probably seen, that would fall into the category of Wuxia. Now that's a vast simplification, but I'm going with I'm going with that just for the sake of my sanity. Because if I go into the, the full explanation, I'll be here all night. <laughs> Tiansha roughly means immortal hero. I think that name alone should give you a bit of a a bit of an idea on to the scale. Mm. Uh, you know, yeah, that that's making sense. You know the. Tiancha is where being a demigod or a god is the standard. <laughs> um, and when it, it is can, it is kind of funny when when people when people talk about the the um the over the topness of within certain anime as if it's some new thing when you go back and look at again classical mythology and it's anything but new. 
the form the form it takes is certainly new, but the concept isn't. I mean, hell, the whole, the whole, the whole isekai thing. I've half jokingly stated that John Carter, a book that came out a hundred years ago, is technically speaking an isekai. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I mean, it's an obvious thing, but I just like bringing it up because it because it because it makes a bunch of people who hate the isekai genre really mad. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> which is which is which is why I do it because that's heat. And if if it's and for me it's for me it's always going to be funny. But when it given that one of the other um one of the other rewards is the denizens of the multiverse deck, which is similar to some of the decks you've done previously. With each of the entry, do you, do you plan on having? a notation about what what world might be best that character or that stat that stat block might be best suited for yes yeah, so that is we have a um let's call it like a, a, a card list of all the different 136 monsters and npcs in there and we indicate where they are from so with the the denizen of the multiverse deck primarily comes from the best of multiverse book and the Dramatis Persona NPC book. And so what we did is we have a chance to take the art, take the character stats, put them together on a sheet. Uh, so it's really convenient to reference them during play. But of course, all the characters, they do come from different locations. You can use them anywhere if you're running a multi-genre game. And there's nothing to say that someone that we say is a thief on Icarus, you could say, well, now they're a thief on this other planet that I just made up. There's there's you know lots of portability in an effects-based system, but there is a reference to where they come from and anyone familiar with the uh, existing expansions that we have they're going to know where these characters come from you can get more context in the books as well so while the denizen of the multiverse deck is a deck of stats and images useful for gameplay it doesn't give the full write-ups of these characters and monsters and that's where you can go into the to the book so if you have the best of the multiverse book or you have the dramatis persona you can actually read more about the characters there now, with the, with that in mind, of, co of course, the next the next major pillar is the Ikarian Quest um, novel, which yeah, I'm so excited to get that out. Yeah, that is that I believe that is intended to be part two of a tr of a of a planned trilogy. That's right, the Ikarian Isekai lit RPG anime series. So that is a trilogy. Ikarian Quest follows up on the exploits of Ikarian Gate, which was out during when we did the Bessa Multiverse Kickstarter. We offered Ikarian Gate. Now we're doing uh, the Ikaris as the primary Bessa Fourth Edition uh, offering in this Kickstarter. And as you can tell by the name, Ikarian Quest, uh, it does have ties into Ikaris, which is one of the reasons we're putting them together for the same Kickstarter as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I did, I, I did also note that you're doing an audiobook version as well. Was that something that you had always planned for, or was, or was it something that came that the idea of doing an audiobook came a little a little um, later in the process? Yeah, that was actually right off the bat. Um, I started got into lit RPGs through audiobooks. I, I don't read as much anymore. I, I tend to unfortunately fall asleep when I'm reading, uh, probably because I do so much for, for work purposes. But audiobooks, I I'm a voracious consumer of audiobooks when I'm driving cars uh, or you know jogging around the neighborhood or whatnot. And so I fell in love with lit RPGs as a as a format for novels and just started going through them like crazy. And when I was contacted by uh, Ethan Freckleton, who's the author of the Akarian series, he reached out and said, hey, you know, might you be interested in a lit RPG trilogy? And instantly I was like, oh my gosh, yes, this is exactly what I want. And I have to do an audiobook because I love audiobooks. And one of the uh, series that I was going through at the time was the very funny um, Cavern and Creatures and the narrator for that with Jonathan uh, Sleep. And so reaching out to Jonathan and to see if he could bring his unique voices into doing the, the trilogy was something we were thrilled to have him on. So it was right off the bat. In the end, there can't be an audiobook without the regular book, of course. You have to have someone writing it. But that was formatted right from the beginning. I said, if I'm going to do lit RPG, we have to do an audiobook as well. 
Yeah, and with the now with that in mind, oh, I do want I as I said before I do want to congratulate you on getting on getting funding in about two hours. You are shooting for ten thousand USD, and it's currently at twenty six point four thousand at the time we're recording this. Um, what would you be shooting for as far as a release window for the digital versions of some of some of the material present? I know the physical end of things can be a little bit painful. Yeah, well, if we can, whenever we do Kickstarters, uh, ideally, everything's done already or next to being done while we're doing the Kickstarter in terms of the art, the layout, the writing, the editing. Uh, and so this is one of those instances where we didn't pull the pit trigger on the Kickstarter until everything was in place. So digital delivery is actually going to be right after the Kickstarter ends. You know, there's always a couple of weeks after a Kickstarter ends to gather funds and get late backers if their credit cards refused. And, you know, so Kickstarter holds things back for a bit. But a couple of weeks afterwards in March, we'll be delivering all the digital goods. And then we have the physical products uh, in pre-press right now. Uh, we sent them off to make sure we get, uh, you know, good uh, proofing and, and stock and, you know, there's a lots of involved with a printing job. You just don't send it off and they start printing it right away. There's lots of pre-steps and so we're we're taking some of those pre-steps now uh, to ensure that we have a delivery this summer of the print edition. Mm -hmm. And I'll, cer I'll certainly be looking forward to that. But with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. You're very welcome, and thanks for having us on when it again. It's always great to, to come out and, and talk about what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And of course, anytime you see fit to return, whether it's for more of Besom or for something else or, or to just um, laugh at the dice gods screwing over everybody because the dice gods hate everyone. The door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. And, of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present... My name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>